Good evening. Uh, we are back to chapter seven of book two of the Spirit's book. Um, today we're going to discuss mental impairment and insanity. Uh, always a, a challenging chapter to discuss, um, but uh, I believe we we have the the basis there to understand better uh, the reasons behind uh, these difficult situations that we may face on our lives and our loved ones. Okay, Philip. 371. Are there any grounds to, to the commonly held belief that individuals with developmental impairments have inferior souls? No, they have a human soul that is often more intelligent than you think. This soul suffers from the deficiencies of its means to communicate, as a mute person suffers from his inability to speak. Oh, very important concept to begin with. The fact that someone presents uh, mental or physical challenges does not mean that it is a uh, a less evolved spirit, uh, a spirit that uh, is behind on, a, on the path of evolution than we, uh, the average ones, are. We are all imperfect spirits, so to call these spirits imperfect is the same as we, we are our, ourselves imperfect spirits. But they are not, uh, we cannot say they are less evolved than we are. Most Mostly they are facing uh, the need to go to this trial or this expiation as a way to progress for them or as a way to, to help those around them, those that are going to take care of them. So it's important first to eliminate this idea that because they have mental or physical challenges that they are less evolved than we are. It absolutely does not mean that. Can it be that? Yes, it can, because again, nothing is 100% uh, one side or the other. Can it be a spirit that is, uh, is less evolved? Yes, but still in that case, is in, it's an expiation, is a case of, uh, of uh, going through an atonement or for something that they have done and that they have to go through. Sometimes a way to prevent these spirits to act on their inferior tendencies that uh, they would be otherwise tempted to act because they repeatedly act on inferior tendencies and cause harm to others. So a way of preventing them uh, to, to act on, the, those, on these inferior tendencies is to give them uh, uh, imperfections that will prevent them to act, okay? Okay, next. 372? Yes. What is God's purpose in creating developmentally impaired beings? These individuals are the incarnations of spirits who are under a going atonement. They suffer from their limitations and inability to express themselves through undeveloped or incapacitated organs. Would it be incorrect to say that the organs have no influence on the faculties? We have never said that the organs have no influence. They have a very great influence on the manifestation of, fac of the faculties, but they are not their source. There is a huge difference. A skilled musician will not make good music with a bad instrument, but this will not stop the individual from being a good musician. One must distinguish between the normal and pathological states. In the normal state, morality trumps material obstacles, but there are cases where matter presents such a strong resistance that it hampers or impairs the manifestations as in developmental impairments and insanity. These are pathological cases, and as the soul does not enjoy full freedom, 
laws originating from human societies exempt such individuals from the accountability for their actions. Okay. So, uh, God's purpose, the natural law, and uh, for, for us to have these uh, developmentally impaired uh, spirits incarnated. Uh, in general, this is an atonement, as I explained before. So again, for those that just join us, this is not a sign, first question that we discuss, this is not a sign of a less evolved spirit necessarily, it can be, but it can also be a much more evolved spirit, spirit intellectually that needs to rest, restrain their, their uh, inferior tendencies or a spirit like Marcel in the book, Heaven and Hell, that comes to serve as an example to all those around how someone completely uh, debilitated in their physical uh, instrument can be such a, a positive influence in those around them. So that's, you know, different cases of spirits that uh, are incarnated with a physical or mental inabilities. And then it's important to understand here that uh, Kardec asks if it's incorrect to say that the organs have no influence. The spirits, yes, it's incorrect. The organs have an influence, but they are not the source of the manifestation of the faculties. The source is always the spirit. The organs can prevent the manifestation of the spirit. So they have the influence of, uh, uh, of um, causing a difficulty for the spirit to manifest itself. And the example that, they, that uh, the spirits give here is very good. A skilled musician will not make good music with a bad instrument, but he continues to be a good, good musician. So uh, a spirit that has intellectual abilities that he, he or she is no, not able to manifest in the present incarnation does not mean that they don't have their, their abilities. They do have the abilities. Uh, it's just that um, a bad instrument, as they say here, prevents them from manifesting it. And again, um, or the commentary from Kardec is the difference between pathological and normal states, meaning our regular state, uh, where morality trumps material obstacles. So our moral uh, evolution, our moral state uh, is able to overcome any material obstacles for us to manifest our morality. But when there is a pathological cases, uh, like uh, the, the, the human law that prevents uh, people that are mentally impaired to be prosecuted to the full extent of the law because of their condition. Uh, it's the same thing. The spirits are not responsible, fully responsible for their actions if they have pathological uh, restrictions in their manifestations, okay? It's a little bit uh, complex this also. If anyone has any questions, doubts here, please let me know. It's important to, yes, Daniel. So uh, again, I don't know if it's too soon to start asking questions. No, uh, never too soon. Yeah, sometimes the answer is just coming back by, but I know that back in that time, we didn't have medicine or science evolved as we have today, the technology and resources. So, when individuals like that are under treatment or are of, have resources available to minimize the impairments or even uh, help with the organs that might be compromised. So is that just part of our involvement? Yes. They, they are coming through this atonement in a different era and it's a little bit maybe easier, not so hard maybe when Kardec was writing the book that they were basically set aside and, you know, 
the family the basically same, has the same thing with ma that. with medicine advancements with uh, science advancements everything that we have available to improve our life conditions in any aspects of our lives <clears throat> is welcome right so if we have um the 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 expiation the atonement that they have to go through they have to go through so if anything that we can do to minimize their suffering and their struggles uh it's our, in our obligation as uh, as charitable uh human beings to do that right to try to help those so yes at that time we barely have had anything to help them nowadays we have much better instruments but still we have you know we don't have uh, we don't have a cure for mental impairments right we have medicine that can improve the condition that can help them live a better life as we can see some uh, uh, down syndrome individuals uh, living uh, a very um, integrated life into society more and more we are learning how to deal with that so this is these are all progress of society that helps those spirits and help us all right to to um, uh, to be empathetic with this uh, their sufferings would be more open to help and assist them yes um elmo i don't know if you have anything to add on the medical aspect of it that you probably know better I think beyond the medical or the advancement or the intellectual advancement or the techniques that we have today to help in many, many different cases of physical anomalies or mental anomalies. I think the, the greatest thing that I, I have noticed and is, is the elimination or the betterment of our prejudices, of our taboos towards the those who are so-called abnormal, those who have any kind of um, deficiencies. I think the most important thing is more and more is we see, as I said, those who have chronic problems, things that our science cannot help yet, being more and more integrated and find ways to have them to participate in society in accordance to their abilities. And I think that's exactly what the, this answer deals with. Well, the physical body has a problem, but the spirit doesn't. So I think it's, as we society will improve, it becomes our responsibility to fit them in accordance with the limitations of that defected physical body, so they can operate the best of, of the abilities, the spirit that's normal. I think it's way beyond um, the development of techniques, but the moral qualities that we are developing, that we want to integrate those guys, we want to have them be a part of the normal society as much as possible. I think the Paralympic is a great example. Yeah, yeah you can you can see a Steve Hawkins, right? Um, if uh, if he was fifty years before or thirty years before, he wouldn't have been able to 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 do anything, right? Because his disease was there was no technology to help him communicate. Um, if you guys remember that movie, My Left Foot, uh, it's a great example of the difficulties for someone that the spirit is trapped inside a body that cannot communicate. Only using the left foot, he can could communicate, and uh, he he was able to 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 make people discover that he could communicate, and uh, and became a even it became a movie that Daniel De Luz won won the Oscar for it. It was a 20 years ago movie, but uh, it's a very good one that shows the the spirit trapped, a spirit perfectly functioning, spirit trapped in a body that couldn't do anything. Um, so we have all these examples around us, right? 
Yeah, not too long ago, the families would pretty much hide the family members who had some kind of deficiencies. It's like an embarrassment to the family. Today, you see that it's less common, that's more common to put them out there and let them be a part of the community. Yeah. It's, uh, it's us progressing, right? Society progressing, right? Yeah. We, we say that uh, spiritism tells us that we are always evolving. This is the proof that we are always evolving. We are dealing better with this situation than we were before. And we will deal much better in the future. When we look back 200 years from now, we'll look at our behavior today and we'll be saying, how could we? Yeah. Because we are always evolving, right? Okay. Okay, next, Philip. 373, what is the point in the existence of developmentally impaired individuals who can neither do, can do neither good nor bad and cannot progress? Such an existence is imposed as an atonement for the misuse of certain faculties. It is a time of confinement. This implies that the body of a mentally disabled person could contain a spirit that once embodied a genius. Yes, a genius can become a curse when it is abused. Intellectual superiority does not always accompany moral superiority, and the greatest geniuses may be burdened by many moral trespasses for which they must atone. They often have to endure an inferior existence, which is a cause of suffering for them. The barriers impairing their faculties are like shackles that restrain the movements of a strong person. The developmentally disabled person may be said to be mentally handicapped as cripples are handicapped by their legs and the blind by their eyes. Okay, so first, um, the first question was from Kardec was why, right? If, uh, if they cannot do anything, why? And, um, and the spirits tells us this, this existence are an atonement for the misuse of certain faculties. It's a time of confinement, meaning a time of reflection, right? It's like when someone um, someone is put in a prison for a crime that they committed. It's a time of confinement and reflection for them to be able to reflect on what they did and maybe to, to, to progress uh, by uh, going through the experience. So we could, uh, we already talked about the reincarnation, the reincarnation, the human body as a sort of prison for all of us, because it prevents us from fully expressing ourselves as eternal spirits. We do not bring all of our intellectual abilities to, a, to an incarnation. These are cases of more, even more uh, re, re, uh, confinement than a regular um, incarnated spirit. So in, let's say you are put in a solitary, you are confined to your own world. Uh, what's the use of that? There is always progress. There is always learn. Um, and then when uh, he asked the spirits, if a, if a mentally disabled person could contain a spirit that once embodied a genius. Uh, I, I'm re I was just reading today um, a book by Ivone Pereira, the author of a uh, Memoirs of a Suicide, a, a book in Portuguese that is not translated, then that she describes her interactions with Chopin, the composer, that uh, died uh, when he was 39 years old with uh, tuberculosis and other diseases. Uh, he was a, a genius, a composer, a musician. And, um, and she mentioned that uh, right after that, uh, that incarnation, he had a very short and difficult incarnation, unknown incarnation to, as an atonement 
for the involuntary suicide he committed during his life as Chopin. I don't know what it means. I, I went to read Chopin's uh, story to uh, try to understand better. There is nothing there that talks about him being an involuntary suicide, just that he struggled with his tuberculosis, but maybe it doesn't say how he caught tuberculosis. Maybe he caused the damage to his physical body. I don't know. So this is a, a case, and I was reading this question and uh, the same day reading that, uh, that uh, book, uh, this is a case of someone that uh, comes up with a short uh, reincarnation. He probably died young. He probably had a very difficult, uh, challenged life. They don't say what, if it was mentally, if it was physically. Uh, he had no uh, ability to, to use his mus music and arts knowledge because according to her, previously he was a famous painter called uh, uh, Sanzio. Sanzio, an Italian painter. Um, so, you know, he's always involved with arts. So, you know, we come to, uh, to these incarnations too as an expiation, as an atonement. And uh, it doesn't mean that the spirit inside that physical body and uh, constrained by that physical body could not be a genius that they have to, over, to come through this suffering to, to learn, to develop, to, to improve themselves and to uh, face the consequence of their own actions. Okay? Questions, comments here? Uh, we don't have the musicians here today, Fabio or Ricardo, <laughs> to talk about Chopin. I brought Chopin today and no musicians are here. <laughs> uh, Daniela, yes. I want to give an example of someone that was seen as a, a, a genius, like Elizabeth Holmes, that very young entrepreneur that became a fraud. I don't know if people are following in the news what happened to her. She became a very young billionaire. Uh, she created her own company and became like a sort of this young female genius in this kind of business, she created this biotechnology company trying to test blood in a very simple way. And then they now learned that it was all fraud, that she's maybe she's a genius uh, intellectually, but morally she has Evil a very low standards. <laughs> so, and, and she, I think she's facing prison time or she could face prison time and she's uh, being uh, judged as a fraud and her business now is gone like a billion dollar business is gone so in her case she's probably it's a good thing for her to happen this during the, this incarnation because if she would bring that kind of a baggage to the next incarnation she could come as, as someone with some kind of impairment or no? Like it's not that uh, serious. The, yeah, the key question here, Daniela, is what is she going to learn from the experience and how much she's going to evolve from the experience? Because, you know, you know the, the famous phrase, uh, you go to inside a prison, nobody's guilty of anything, right? Yeah, everybody claims that they are innocent, right? So if she goes through her mm -hmm. life, uh, thinking that she was uh, persecuted or she was uh, uh, she, it was not fair trial that she was doing her best. If she doesn't learn anything from the lesson, then she will have to carry the, the consequences on a new incarnation on the spiritual world. But she, if she takes the opportunity to learn and even to address, because the first is to learn and then to to address the mistakes, right? To correct the mistakes, to repair and to regenerate them. Yes, good that she's, she went, she's going through the experience in this incarnation, but uh, only she can answer at the end of it if what have she learned or what have she take advantage of the experience, right? But, but even the scandal in itself, it's already... Um... <laughs> It, it, it's a lesson in itself, right? Like it, it, it's just the first step. 
like the embarrassment the or the shame that that in itself cannot be uh, a forced way of l learn like learning like you have no no way out you you have to go through this because you're facing the consequences of your acts even though if she doesn't learn much out of this or it, it we cannot consider that is a step one of in the learning process no we cannot because uh, we don't know if she's accepting and recognizing it or not right it's, yeah, it's, only, it's only her yes yeah, so. we consider that as a great opportunity not a lesson yet but a, an opportunity to learn that lesson yeah but if she's going to learn or not it's on her right yeah, the same way that someone may may reincarnate in uh, in a confinement as you said with a um severely damaged physical body is again just an opportunity may may live this incarnation even more rebellious even more angry at god that done this to me i don't deserve this it's not right it's not fair the opportunity is there but how are we going to use it yeah, I think it, that was a, I, that was what I was missing in my uh, thoughts, like my thinking. So it's not necessarily that even the persons that we are describing here, given the examples, they're necessarily going to take advantage of this opportunity. They could go back, as you say, not learning what they needed to learn or, or they were supposed to, right? Yeah, or even compromise themselves even more with the divine laws. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Renato, you asked a question here that uh, has not much to do with what we're studying, but let me address it. Um, in case of avoids or spirits that lost human form, uh, presents as snake dragons. Is the reincarnation process the same or the benefactors need to work on that very spirit to bring it back to human form? If that's the case, where is the merit from those who lost the human form? Um, the, of course, for a new reincarnation, the benefactors need to, uh, the, the, the peri spirit is malleable. So it can be brought back to, to a new form, but uh, it will be attached to the new, new, um, the new body that is being formed, right? So the, the, they lose, because the ovoid has a, 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 have only one thought. So in order to, 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 to dismantle the ovoid, you have to remove this uh, mono thought that they have. And then they will acquire a spiritual form, right? So the benefactors will have to work there, and it's part of the process of their work. But um, but it is a it, it takes a while. It's not a, a very simple process of reincarnation. These are special cases. So voids are, are exceptions, and uh, those spirits that uh, uh, go, are going through lycanthropy also they lose the human form and presents themselves as beasts. It's also special cases, and they need to work on it. But um, it's not that, uh, I don't know exactly what you mean, the merit, but uh, they have to, they will face a difficult reincarnation because of the state that they are, the mental state that they are, they will face a difficult reincarnation, okay? I Does hope that I you present as uh, this mental impaired disabled uh, case that we are studying here? Uh, no, we are, uh, we are, you know, it can be some of those uh, spirits that are mentally or physically, uh, mental, especially mentally disabled, disabled could be spirits that were in a ovoid form or a, a, a lycanthropy form. But I, I would, again, I would think that's the exception, not the rule, okay? It can happen, but I don't think it's the rule. It will be the exception. Because sometimes, you know, that's not what exactly what they need. What they need is a difficult incarnation, a difficult incarnation where they are conscious 
of the difficulties with uh, you know, being born to a mother, which is the ob object of their mono idea, the hatred with their mono idea, or a father, or a sibling, um, or situations that cause them the situation that that uh, hatred to face the situation, and for that they need to be somewhat conscious of what they are seeing and they are facing. Okay. It's difficult because each case is a case, but uh, I, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm more inclined to think that they will come in an incarnate, difficult incarnation, but uh, aware and conscious of their own state. It may be on a, on a physically challenged state, which prevents them from acting, but uh, less in a mental state, I think. I don't know, Elmo, if you have any different thoughts. Truth, I never read anything that deals with reincarnation of, of voids or spirits who lived uh, in the spirit world in a like, lycanthropic state. I never read anything like that. But my guess, and again, it's my guess, that there's a good chance that they will come in with some degree of the efficiency of difficulty. But I think what John said is the more important thing. It, it's really case by case because for some of them to have their whole faculty may be an important uh, part of that reincarnation for them to understand, to be very aware, conscious as an incarnate being of the struggles they are going through. But again, I, I don't even know if there is any book over there that deals with that matter. I don't remember reading anything like that then also. Thank you. Uh, Luisa has a question she posted on the chat. Is the spirit of someone with mental illness is it free of the illness? Meaning the spirit doesn't have the mental illness. Uh, we are going to discuss this, Luisa, as I mentioned here, okay? It will be a couple of questions later, right? Um, actually starts on 375, so 374, Philip. Is a spirit who is developmentally impaired conscious of his or her mental condition? Yes, very often. It understands that the restraints hampering its actions are a trial and an atonement. So what, they're, what Kardec is asking here is the spirit, when it's free from the physical body, meaning in a state of sleep, in a, in a state of uh, dissociation with the physical body, is un understands the impairment. And uh, the spirits say very often, yes. Again, it's not yes always, it's yes very often. So not always the case. And we'll see that on and address Luisa's question on it. It understands the restraints hampering its actions it's a, a, an atonement, a trial, and uh, so depends on how important it is for the spirit to be aware of the condition and to learn from that condition. So the spirit will be aware if it, uh, if it has an ability to learn and to evolve from that condition, uh, which in many cases is the case, right? Because the, the, you know, are you aware that you are in a prison? Yes, you are aware that you are in a prison, right? That you have no uh, a way, no way of getting out of the prison, uh, and um, you know it's the same, more or less the same thing. Again, uh, same an analogy. Okay. Okay. When a person is insane, what is the state of that individual spirit? When a spirit is free, it receives impressions directly and directly exerts its action on matter as well. When a spirit incarnates, it is in an entirely different condition and is required to act only through the designated organs. If some or all of those organs are impaired, its actions or impressions concerning those organs are interrupted. Individuals beset by such impairments become blind if they lose their eyes, deaf 
if they lose their ears, and so on. Imagine now that the organ responsible for manifestation of intelligence and will is partially or entirely impaired, and you will easily understand that the use of such an incomplete or distorted organ will provoke a functional distress that the spirit is fully conscious of, but unable to control. Then it is always the body and not the spirit that is dysfunctional. Yes, but remember that just as a spirit <coughs> acts on matter, matter in turn reacts upon the spirit, at least to a certain extent. Due to the altered state of its receptor organs, the spirit may temporarily receive various impressions. When the insanity continues for, a lo for long periods of time, the repetition of the same acts may exercise a permanent influence on a spirit. It only ends with its complete separation from all material impressions. Okay, in English, please, right, Paco? <laughs> um, so, <laughs> And the question from Kardec is here. So the person is mentally challenged. What's the state of the spirit? Uh, the spirit cannot act on because the physical body restrains the ability to, of the spirit to express itself. So the spirit can see, but if it's blind, the physical body is blind, the spirit cannot see. Uh, the physical body cannot see and cannot transmit to the spirits what it's seeing. It cannot hear, cannot transmit to the spirit what it's hearing. So what is, what is the other way around? What happens to the spirit? And what they, they are trying to tell us here that uh, the spirit acts upon matter, but matter reacts upon the spirit. Remember the cases, let's say, if you smoke your whole life, you affect your perispiritual lungs. You carry the consequences of the, 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 the harm that you have caused to your lungs, to your perispirit, and it's going to manifest in a new reincarnation as an asthma, as an emphysema, some uh, respiratory disease. So by that example, we know that what happens to the physical body can reflect on the spirit. So if a spirit is mentally challenged and uh, the, the physical body is mentally challenged, in a spirit in an incarnation is mentally challenged, it can, again, it doesn't always happen, but it can reflect on the spirit and even when the physical body dies, the spirit still can go through a certain period of uh, inability to be oneself until it, as they say here, until it has a complete separation from all material impressions. So the spirit is not mentally challenged, okay? The physical body is, but some impressions of this experience can uh, reflect on the perispirit and the spirit back in the spiritual life can feel the effects of it for a certain period of time. Okay? I hope I was clear. I don't know, Elmo, if you can uh, say in another way here to make it even better. Sorry, it's muted. I don't know. I think it's pretty clear to me. Um, there is a limit to a way influence of the body to the to the spirit. The, from the spirit to the body, it's always uh, percent, but there is some that reflects back of the state of the physical body to the, to the spirit. If the spirit needs to deal with a body that cannot 
see in the physical world, it will directly impose limitation of what this spirit is able to manipulate in that physical world. It's going to impose limitation to the spirit to operate. So therefore, it will limit the ability of the spirit to do other things. Because if that was not the case, then it would make no sense to come in with these trials. It would not reflect somehow back to the spirit. Some of, some of it has to reflect back to the spirit. It's not that the spirit is blind, but it, right now, completely connected to a blind physical body, it limits its ability to function, to operate. It forces the spirit to find the alternatives to operate. It forces the, the, the spirit to be, to resign to the things that he or she cannot change. Because if there was absolutely no reflection of the difficulties of the physical body back to the spirit, would it really be a waste of, a, of an incarnation? But important to say, the spirit is not blind. The physical body is blind. The, phys the pet spirit generated a, 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 a physical body that is defected in, a, in the part that deals with vision. The spirit itself is not blind. Okay. Uh, so before you, Daniel, uh, Renato asked a question here also, but uh, I'm going to to read the question, but it's for you, Elmo, more for you than for me here. Go ahead. Since matter affects the spirit and most human treatments, drugs can cause problems with other organs in the body for being so strong, that damage is also responsibility of the spirit? No, I won't say so. Let's assume that someone is going to a chemotherapy treatment for cancer. That is purely on the physical body. That should not go into the spirit. But the state of mind, the state of uh, to resign to that necessity, to that difficult treatment that causes so much difficulty to the spiritual encounter what attached that physical body may have an effect to the spirit. But then you see it's more of a moral problem and not a really physical material problem. Can you say that one more time? All right, so let's say that I am diagnosed with uh, some kind of leukemia and I need to go through a very difficult kind of chemotherapy treatment that will generate tremendous serious difficult uh, side effects. I will be suffering from many different things. It may even cause some permanent um, defects in my physical body. It may affect my ability, my hearing. Some of the, some of the drugs that no, at it's called uh, audio toxic. They affect the ability to hear. And in order to treat that chemotherapy, to treat that, um, that cancer, that leukemia, I have to buy the bullet and accept the loss of hearing perhaps. Okay, I'm just an example. Okay. This will not affect my perispirit. But if I am while going to that chemotherapy without uh, beginning to lose my, my hearing, I start to be completely rebellious to, to the laws. I start to kick the dog out of anger because God's not fair to me. I'm going to take it upon his creation. I got to be really mean to everyone else because I am suffering here. 
that may affect my, my perispirate, not the chemotherapy, my moral problem. You see the difference there? Yeah, got it now. Because yeah, the way I was thinking um, also on the mental impairment, since it was something that the spirit created and now needs to deal with at the physical level, and some of these drugs and treatments, you know, will cause harm to the body. But since in the first place he's in this position because of something in the past he's done, it, I wasn't sure if whatever happens because of treatments will be also a uh, responsibility or is just uh, uh, an effect of something, you know, that he's done in the past. And, you know, that's, that's why I asked the question. Well, those, those side effects of the medications or all the, and some really serious um, side effects those medications, uh, adverse effects, if you prefer, are purely physical. It's all moral qualities that will decide how much of it I'll be responsible for, not purely physical. Thank you. Danny. So in the last paragraph here, it's saying that if the spirit is uh, during the incarnation has uh, is going through insanity, right, and it lasts for too long, then the spirit might get compromised. And it says that it only ends when it, it the separation from material impressions are complete. What does it mean, like this complete separation? Um. Remember when we, we discussed uh, attachments to the physical body uh, beyond the 72 hours, right? Attachments okay. to material, physical uh, body or physical uh, necessities that uh, may have, or some spirits have. So they have to stay connected to, to their house or to the, someone that is drinking and someone that is eating. So what they're saying here is this. When you are free of all these physical attachments is when the, the influence on the perispirit is completely disappears, okay? That's what they want to say here. So, for example, we, we have some stories in several books that when spirits go back to the spiritual world, they are treated, for example, they went through a disease mm -hmm. and then they're still suffering. The spirit spirit is still compromised. So in the case of insanity, in the way they explain here, as soon as they're separated from the body, they don't need treatment over there, like mental they treatment, do. or they, they might they need do. mental treatment still. No, they do need treatment. I'm not talking about mental treatment. They do need treatment to to be uh, to free themselves from these uh, physical influences, they are assisted. Of course, a, a spirit that comes uh, that spend a whole life uh, mentally challenged is not a spirit that uh, it's not a spirit that uh, has has accumulated any karma in this incarnation, right? It, it's not a spirit that is uh, ha, that has a mental uh, disposition to associate itself to any sort of uh, spiritual uh, vibrational level. So mm -hmm. it's a spirit that when it when discarnates is immediately assisted by the spiritual benefactors and taken to a place where they can receive the necessary treatment for them to overcome the challenges of the incarnation they had just finished. But, but the, the feeling insane, like feeling out of control, that, that's no longer, that's not part of the spirit. That's what they're saying. The spirit itself cannot be called insane. The spirit, it, it's, no, the spirit is never insane. The spirit may be feeling effects of the incarnation that he was an insane person. Um, so that can carry some of, uh, 
of, of its effects. Uh, you know, same thing with the, uh, the, the, the lungs of, a, of someone that has smoked, the pure spiritual lungs, they are not damaged for eternity. They are damaged temporarily. So the spirit may be affected temporarily by the recent incarnation where they were mentally challenged. But it's a, 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 a treatment, they go through the treatment process in the spiritual world and eventually go back to their old self, overcome it, right? Because unless they are, you know, they, they are, they're not going to come into a new reincarnation with the same mental challenge. So they have to readjust to their previous uh, spiritual level there in the spiritual world. So they have to be treated for it. And it's, it's, it's difficult for them to overcome them themse by themselves. They need the assistance of the spiritual benefactors. Again, I said difficult, not impossible, because let's say a spirit that comes to an incarnation like that, fully aware of the necessity, and uh, it's a more evolved spirit in terms of a knowledge, understanding, and uh, it can recover by itself. Let's say uh, the, the example I gave earlier with Chopin, right? Maybe Chopin recovered by himself. He didn't need any, um, any much of a spiritual system. There is always a spiritual system. Everybody has a spiritual system, as long as they're open to. And when a spirit is more evolved, it will be more open to receive spiritual assistance because understands the necessity of it. But maybe they are more able to, to, to do the work by themselves and less with the help, okay? Okay. All right, next. Why does insanity sometimes lead to suicide? The spirit suffers from its restriction and inability to manifest itself freely. It seeks death as a means of breaking these chains. Desperation for being in prison. That's the best I can talk about the need to kill oneself because of your uh, mental inability to, to express oneself. Again, uh, is it is a, a regular suicide or it is a special case of suicide? Of course, the more you know, the more you are aware of your action, the more responsible you are. You cannot, if a, if a mentally challenged person is not judged by human laws the same way that as a sane person, you cannot expect a mentally challenged spirit to be, to have the face to face the same consequences of someone that commits suicide fully knowing what they are doing. But it is still a suicide and it still has consequences. John, I just want to go back and see if Louisa, if she feels that her question was answered. Mute, As it was. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> okay. All right. Next. Read read the night last two. Uh, so we finish the, the, the subject. We have six minutes. Is the imbalance that is the underlying cause of an insane person's suffering carried over from the physical life to the spirit world? The spirit may continue to feel it after death until it is completely freed from matter. This is similar to how one feels drowsy when waking from a very deep sleep. 378, how can the brain alteration act on the spirit after death. It is a memory that weighs heavily on a spirit. The spirit is not aware of all that took place due to the insanity and needs a certain amount of time to recover. This is why its agitation after death is always proportionate to the length of time it suffered in its physical life. When a spirit is free from the body, it still feels the impression of the bonds that tied it to its physical life for a period of time. 
So this is more, again, more things related to, to Luisa's question, right? Um, the, the spirit will feel the effect of, uh, of the, 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 the physical state that they have uh, until, again, until it's completely free from matter. It's exactly what we discussed. And the, the example that the spirits give here when we wake up from a very long deep sleep, you feel drowsy. You feel, you know, if you if you see someone that wakes up from a coma or someone that wakes up from anesthesia, uh, they feel drowsy and confused after waking up. So you can imagine going back to the spiritual world after a long life of inability to express one fully express oneself. It will take a while for you to recover your abilities. Um, and then the second, the second question talks a little bit more of the same, a memory that weighs heavily on a spirit. Um, the spirit needs a certain time to recover. And the more time it's spent on the physical life, the more time it will take in the spiritual world uh, to to recover in the majority of cases. Again, not all cases, because you have some spirits that are more aware of the challenge of the condition and have a better ability to recover themselves. Um, but, you know, we, we talk about spirits that come to our mediumship meetings, talking about all the impressions that they feel of the physical body that they just left behind, right? The pain, the, the, the headaches and everything, the, the weaknesses. These are all impressions that are carried over to the spiritual world from the physical body they just left behind. And until they understand that they no longer need to feel that, they no longer have the physical body. And these are all um, effects on the physical body they will struggle a little to, to overcome these, um, these impressions, these challenges, okay? Okay, any final questions, comments? Okay, so Renato has another question here. In the cases where the spirit reincarnation is transpired in a limited body, how the impairment is done? Is the pure spirit damaged? Something that on the parent side, how does it work? Well, the, when the spirit is preparing for the reincarnation, it, it's all formed through the parents, right? The DNAs and the, um, the, the, the attributes of each parent. So they can uh, modify the genetic structure of the new physical body, choosing the right instruments to become uh, an impaired spirit uh, in case that uh, they, either the spirit or the mentors that are coordinating, right? Um, I don't know if Elmo has anything else to say, but I, it's as simple as that. The spirits can, can manipulate the uh, In the cases where the spirit reincarnation is to inspire in a limited body, in a body that has limitations, how the impairment is done. Is the perispirit damaged? No. Is something that the parents side? Yes. How does it work, Elmo? Yeah, um, I'll give just my impression because I haven't read. I don't know exactly how that would happen. Um, one thing for sure, it will not break the natural laws of biology, of hereditarity, right? Would there have, have to be something that the parents have in their DNA, the ability to pass those deficiencies to the offspring, even if the parents do not have it? Okay. And the next option would be what John said, that during that formation of the new physical body, the specialized spiritual doctor, so to say, may be able to manipulate some of the cells to, to create that deficiency. But that's just a guess also. I have never read anything regarding to that also. But the most important here is that 
there will be no breakage of natural laws, physical or otherwise. Thank you. Okay, so thank you all. Uh, the announcements, the usual announcements, the, the lecture this Saturday is from Joaquin Eleuterio called the Spiritist's Mission. Um, as Spiritists, we have received a mission from our creator. We also have been assigned tasks that will help develop ourselves, our planet, or even the universe. Let's explore together some of the options and choices that we have to make along this divine quest, okay? Um, we are getting close also next weekend, the, the, the virtual course from the United States Spiritist Federation, Initiation to Spiritism, Into Spiritism, starts on January 23rd at 10 a.m. So if you know someone that you would like to recommend, please ask them to enroll, to buy the book that is also available already. And uh, it's going to be a series of classes given by uh, many spiritists here uh, in the US and uh, even Luis, uh, our friend Luis uh, gives a couple of those classes also. Uh, book club uh, next week, we'll discuss chapter four of part two of the book, Renunciation, okay? This Sunday, we are going to study the gospel according to Spiritism. Again, we have five Sundays, so we decide to repeat the gospel this Sunday. Uh, next Sunday, the 23rd, Luis is going to give us uh, a lecture also that um, it's, let me get the, the subject of the lecture here. It's, Uh, matter and its constitution. So that's the on the 23rd at 11 a.m. A lecture by Luis Leo. Okay. Um, Carol, can you do our final prayer? Are there? Sure, absolutely. Infinite creator and divine providence, we give thanks tonight for being together to study the spirits of chapter seven mental impairment and insanity. We've, we've learned that it is always the body and not the spirit that is dysfunctional. The spirit is Spiritual benefactors thankfully can assist with treatments in the spiritual world after discarnation. It may take some time, however, to recover from the physical life and the remembrance of body sensations. Everything is always directed by the natural laws. We are grateful for our spiritual benefactors, the good spirits, the helpers, the healers, the spiritual doctors who are with us, helping us, assisting us to bring forth these teachings to help us to go deeper in our understanding and to share the opportunity to be together for our study in unity. We are grateful for all that we have learned this evening and may we continue this deep dive and have a better understanding of of the mental impairments and insanity. We are grateful for the love, light, and peace of Christ to be with us. And we ask to open our hearts and minds to this energy to be more loving, more compassionate, and open to our abilities to share with others as we are directed through our discernment, excuse me, our discernment. We ask humbly now for safety and protection as we return to family, friends, loved ones, and coworkers, for we are never alone and we are always guided day by day. May we humbly ask now to receive the love, light, and peace of Christ to strengthen us and to encourage us and to guide us. We close now and ask for the continuation 
throughout the week for these blessings. And those who are in need, those who may are in need of healing, their family members as well, may they receive these blessings. We are grateful for what we have received and may we remind ourselves to be beacons of light. Go forth now in peace and in gratitude, so be it. <laughs>